the land, not the Indians. Hold it right up We have certain rights that has never been extinguished here by due process of law. The land is ours, the land is originally ours, and it's still ours. Nothing has ever happened to change that law. Mr. Legoo, you are under arrest, charge of section 602L of the penal code, which is occupying real property without permission of the owner. I submit to your authority on the protest. Standing up to the sheriff and his gun. Bayonet, my heart is there with you. taught that there is democracy, you know. We have been taught of these things ever since I was a student. And as a student, I kept, I was amazed of how fancy our Constitution is. And along with this amazement, I look around and see it was not the case. This is not the America that I was taught to be. And I kept wondering why, why is it this way? Why must people face this type of a situation? Pacific Gas and Electric Company went and they persuaded the government that they wanted the franchise and the concession by the government to uh, build power sites along and up and down the Pitt River. As I understand it, 
The PG&E at this time is one of the richest corporations in the state, possibly the whole nation. They have uh, large holdings here and they're making money. But the thing is, on our side, as Indian people, none of these things were ever, uh, or none of our people were ever approached to get our consent or agreement that any of our tribal assets should be taken by this corporation. And uh, all up and down the river, we had uh, uh, originally our salmon runs. Our people lived on the na natural food provided by the rivers, as well as the forests. And eventually, because of the uh, chains of uh, powerhouse and the diversion of the river and the drying up of rivers in large parts, finally destroyed our fishing, our natural food of fish, and our people began to deteriorate. I'm talking about the federal forests whereby uh, we haven't been paid a dime for timber rights either. And today, uh, they're making millions of dollars off of us. And today, our people are, again, unemployed most of the year round, again amongst the poorest people in the country, uh, whereby uh, large uh, logging companies uh, make millions of dollars. We want people to know that uh, we aren't going to be pushed around any longer. Well, as the uh, councilman of the Pit River Tribe, one of the uh, areas, I feel kind of honored to uh, welcome all of you people here. We have occupied our land. We've taken a position in this specific place, which is part of our land. We'll carry the, uh, we'll carry the challenge to the corporation. Basically, the newness that you feel here on the land itself is, is a newness that uh, sort of it's been hidden from you. It's a fence that's been around you for so long. This land is yours. The, the buildings here are yours. There's one that's lit up. For the women that want to cook, go over there and cook. The rest of you people that are on security, get on security. And patrol it like it's yours. Right now, I think the only thing we can do until the morning is to go out and find yourself a place where you can sleep. I've been instructed to advise you that uh, the people are in violation of the trespass laws of the penal code of the state of California, <laughs> in that you are entering and occupying dwellings and real property belonging to the Pacific Gas and Electric Corporation. You will be given adequate time to peacefully vacate the premises. If you fail to vacate, arrests for the law violations will occur. We would like to have you out as soon as possible and preferably this evening. Thank you very much. Well, you come back tomorrow and you'll find us here.
Get your squads together, men. But I believe we'd have 60 to 65 officers here. Could I ask why so many? Whenever we go on a detail of this kind, we go with sufficient force to handle any situation that we may be confronted with. Why do you uh, deliberately want to be arrested? Well, the more, the more cases we get in the court, the more likely they ain't going to throw our case out of court so fast. In other words, you're trying to make a test case out of this? Yes. We, we ain't going to be on trial. It's going to be the United States government, not us. Uh, I guess, uh, in some senses, the entire United States belongs to the Indians. Right. Do you plan to take the whole country back? Nope, some of it. We know what we're up to. We know what we're going to face, and we're going to do it. We're going to stand by our decision. You want to be prosecuted? <laughs> yes. How will you plead? Not guilty. You've always been trespassing all over the world. Now you're trespassing right here in your own backyard. You'll pay for it, not the last Let's of it. Let's move them out, man. Let's go. We haven't got Yeah, them. arrest the children. That's all you're good Let's for. Let's move them out. Pull your gun. Pull your clothes. That's all you've got anyway. Oh, you've got it coming. You've got children, and you're going to pay for it, too. You're going to know what it's like. You should be ashamed. Ashamed that you're living on our land. All right, let's uh, start with... The next cabins, man. Anybody in, Is anybody in this cabin? Three. Three. Right. Three. 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 Right. Start arresting these people here. Start getting these people. Hey, uh, fellas, start arresting these people. Escort them over. Load them up. There can be little argument that large corporations and the rich control and run most of our government's policies and that they dictate the American way of life. This big business, big business, get rich syndrome has corrupt America's value system to the point that no one today any longer can trust his own brother or his neighbor. Violence, money, and position of power are the white man's way. The American Indian can no longer allow his values and culture to be destroyed and corrupted by a society that does not relate to one's fellow man, except to see what they can get from him. Why aren't you in here asking PG and E to leave? They're the ones that are trespassing Hold on the land, right not the, the Indians. Hold it right up the Our ancestors started around about 1920. Hopefully, they had filed a petition or redress of grievance against the United States government for the taking of our lands, dispossession of our people, and the general abuse that was suffered by our people in the process of removing Indians. The result of that work was brought to a head in 1963. And this was all done beyond our control and not to our knowledge. And later on, they came and told us we'd have to vote whether we accepted their formula of compromise settlement, one package consolidated agreement for a well, it was uh, stipulated that it would be 47 cents an acre. And so today we feel that the claims case was mishandled. It was compromised and brought to a conclusion without our authority or consent. We hadn't agreed to anything. And at this time, we reassert and reclaim our land. Mr. Lagoo, you are under arrest, charge of section 602L of the penal code, which is occupying real property without permission of the owner. I submit to your authority on the protest. Put your legs out there, please. Do you have any weapons on you at all? You might have a small pocket knife. You want to take it out?
Mr. Grossman, isn't it a little late to, to make a claim on these lands, these people you represent? Well, if it's late, it's the responsibility of the United States government. It took them 117 years to declare, finally, that the land had been illegally taken in 1853. So most of the delay has been due to uh, the United States government. You advise them to do now. So I'm going to go into the meeting with them. Indian title in 1853, but it was your land and taken away legally. So let them come in and say, okay, we took the land illegally. We're going to give them 47 cents an acre for to take care of it. They, they got to say to you, by bringing you into court, they got to say to you that though you've got a decision by the uh, highest body that exists in this country to decide these things, that Congress intend to decide it, Nevertheless, some private corporation, PG&E, can get you arrested. Not only how many, 34 of you, the same way they could get 3,400 of you arrested. And they could not only get you arrested once, they could get you arrested 100 times if you went back. You see, the big questions that are raised, that radicals are supposed to be the only ones that raise, who runs the country? And what does law and order mean? PG&E uh, paid money for record title to this parcel. Uh, our title dates back, in each instance, to the United States government. In other words, this company has paid money for record title directly from the United States government for this land. The largest business in Shasta County is the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, PG&E. PG&E holds in Shasta County 52,525 acres with an assessed valuation of $320 million. PG&E has interlocking ownerships and directorships with a number of the largest corporations in America, including Stanford Research Institute. One of the biggest shareholders in the PG&E is a man named Russell Giffen, who farms in the San Joaquin Valley, 130,000 acres of land. Russell Giffen, over the past several years, has been the second largest recipient of public welfare in the state of California. For instance, in 1969, Giffen received over $3 million for growing cotton and for not growing cotton. The uh, plight of the Indians is uh, symptomatic and uh typical of the, the manner in which uh, a monopoly such as Pacific Gas and Electric Company treats people, whether they be rate payers or in some cases even small shareholders. But the attitude of PG&E, which is exemplified, I think, by uh, the testimony of the president of PG&E, Mr. Shermer Sibley, given under oath, when I said to him, is the $67 million rate increase you're seeking inflationary or non-inflationary, he said it is deflationary. And I said, well, how is that? And he said, because it gives people less money for discretionary spending. Now, he's deciding that one way to meet inflation is to raise your utility bill, giving you less money to spend for things you decide as an individual you might need, whether they're foolish or not foolish. It's interesting to note that Mr. Sibley's salary was, was raised $20,000 last year, so he's now making $150,000 per year. He considers his salary increase to be deflationary as well. Just for the sake of the establishment itself, if you believe in saving it, the establishment has to be saved from its own excesses. What's going on at Pitt River should illustrate to people how difficult the task is uh, toward achieving economic justice in the United States of America in the year 1970. When I talk about the PG&E, uh, I could do the same thing about U.S. Steel or General Motors or whatever. They're all basically the same. The same type of uh, narrow corporate thinking uh, and almost callous indifference to 
uh, the spiritual nature of man uh, as a beautiful creature and animal, uh, the uh, great preoccupation with profit for the sake of profit to the neglect of human values. But the important thing to know is you and I, in a sense, don't have the power to correct those except through uh, organization, union, and numbers. Uh, individually, we can't do it. And, and that's what has to be done. This, and this is why people, whether they're black or brown or red or white, students, uh, intellectuals, uh, oppressed uh, third-layer corporate utility executives have something in common. They're being had, and unless they realize it, they will continue to be had or exploited. pg e is also interlocked with the second largest private business in Shasta County, which is the Pacific Telephone. Pacific Telephone on only six acres of land uh, holds an assessed valuation of $27 million. Pacific Tele Telephone is also interlocked with Levi Strauss, Stanford Research Institute, and the Bank of America. Also, a number of other corporations, including Broadway Hale, W.T. Grant, Wells Fargo, De Georgia Fruit Corporation, Tenneco, Bank of California, U.S. Plywood, and the Southern Pacific Railroad. Third largest private business in Shasta County is Fruit Growers Corporation, which is affiliated with Sunkissed Growers. Fruit Growers owns in Shasta County 82,217 acres with an assessed valuation of $23 million. The fourth largest business in Shasta County is the Southern Pacific Railroad, which owns 165,617 acres with an assessed valuation of $15 million for Shasta County alone. SP is the single largest holder of private land in the state of California. SP is also affiliated with other big businesses in Shasta County, including Pacific Telephone. SP has interlocking ownerships with Stanford Research Institute, Del Monte, Union Oil, Fiberboard Corporation, IBM, Equitable Life Insurance, Texaco Oil, Tenneco, Southern California Edison, Bank of California, Marineland of California, Caterpillar Tractor, New York Life Insurance, Con Edison of New York, and the Ford Foundation. One of the big owners of SP is a man named J.G. Boswell. J.G. Boswell in the San Joaquin Valley owns approximately 125,000 acres of land. Over the past several years, J.G. Boswell has been the single largest recipient of public welfare in the entire state. Boswell received, for example, in 1969, nearly $5 million for growing cotton and for not growing cotton. Another large landowner in Shasta County is Hearst Publications. Hearst Publications owns in Shasta County 38,823 acres with an assessed valuation of nearly $7 million. Publishers Forest Products owns in Shasta County 25,515 acres with an assessed valuation of nearly $2 million. Another big business in Shasta County is Kimberly Clark. Kimberly Clark owns in Shasta County 82,806 acres with an assessed valuation of $8.5 million. Kimberly Clark has interlocking ownerships with a number of national corporations, including Pan American, the First National Bank of New York, and Miller High Life Beer. Kimberly Clark is one of the largest manufacturers and distributors of paper products in America. Now over half of Shasta County is owned by the federal government. And most of the economic benefits from this public land are enjoyed mainly by the big businesses in the area and not by the public. These companies, like Kimberly Clark, L.A. Times, Sunkist, and U.S. Plywood contract with the federal government to buy, buy the timber. They cut the trees for paper and lumber products, which they sell at a profit. They make money off the public land without accepting any of the direct responsibilities of land ownership, such as paying property taxes. The rulers of Shasta County are an intricate part of the vast yet tightly controlled military-industrial complex which runs the country and much of the world. The key interest of this complex is control. Control of products, 
control of markets, control of people, and control of countries. Key elements in their systems of control are information gathering and propaganda. This vital function is performed in part by the Stanford Research Institute. Stanford Research Institute writes reports on urban problems and long-range planning for various governmental agencies. It also does warfare research for the federal government. One example of the complex's attempts at domestic social control is Safeway Stores. Safeway is the second largest chain in America. It is interlocked with the PG&E, the LA Times, the Southern Pacific Railroad, and the Stanford Research Institute. Safeway has been one of the chief roadblocks to efforts of farm workers to organize and improve their economic condition. While other chain stores agreed to purchase only union grapes, Safeway continued to buy non-union grapes. And in our legends and in the teachings of our forefathers, we knew that Mother Nature was the best. It carried out the will of the Great Spirit. It was not our place to dictate or change. It was not our place to impress upon or to inject or to impress or to put forth our ideas to control nature. So today, we, that is one reason why we are so concerned about the present plight of Mother Nature itself, ecology, pollution, pollution of the rivers, bad air and everything else. Because we somehow wished that the people today that is in power could only learn like we had to learn because they have impressed their own thinking. They begin to uh, remake the nature itself to the extent right now we are all worried about the environment and everything else. This is why we have such a strong feeling about this as Indian people. An Indian is not an Indian unless he has a land base because our people has always been close to nature, close to the land. Our whole life was provided and sustained by that which came from the land. And looking at it from that point of view, we Indian people are not too, too many at this point, and we feel that we are fast disappearing from this land of ours. And it's about time that we try to take a stand. And we feel this is an opportune time. We have many people that are concerned of the very things that which we are concerned, ecology and many other things, environmental conditions in many things like that, and we are also concerned. But the fact of the matter is we have been rendered powerless, we have lost our, our voice in matters of this kind, and we want to rebuild this. We would like to preserve our land, we would like to build our people again on the strength of land. The Indian Claims Commission found that the U.S. government took possession of the land illegally. After conceding to the illegality of the action, the Indian Claims Commission offered to pay to these tribes 47 cents per acre. But this money was refused by the Pitt River Tribe of Indians with the contention that as the legal holders of title to the land, that all the land within the boundaries as set down in the findings of the California of the Indian Claims Commission was to be immediately returned to the tribe. The tension then that the Pitt River Indians and other Indians who be in their guests as trespassers, as stated by indirectly the U.S. government and directly PG&E, was ludicrous. The trespassers are indeed the U.S. government. There was no treaty, treaty signed. PG&E and other large corporations as well as the state of California. It has to be remembered that big business and government are almost synonymous terms. Big business and its pressures and certain policies emanating out of government affect affects not only Indians, but poor whites, blacks, and other minorities. The Indian Claims Commission conceded that the land was taken illegally in 1853, and by that omission alone, it would seem that clearly the Indians are not the transgressors of law and order, but the upholders of what law and order stands for. The Indians have never sold the land. They still maintain that they own it. They do not want to sell it. They want the land back. And they want to live on this land according to the ways of their ancestors and according to the ways that uh, they see fit. We believe that money cannot buy the Mother Earth. 
She has sheltered, clothed, nourished, and protected us. We have endured. We are Indian. We are the rightful and legal owners of the land. Therefore, we reclaim all of the resourceful land that has traditionally been ours, with that exception of land now owned by private individuals. On this land, we will set up our own economic and social structure, retaining all of the values that are commensurate with Indian life. We will encourage and help other Indian tribes and groups to establish structures across the country in order to establish intertribal economic and cultural ties, basing the economy upon the barter system. Therefore, let it be known by all concerned that the Pitt River Tribe makes the following demands. Number one, that the U.S. government and the large corporations, including PG&E, PT&T, Southern Pacific Railroad, Kimberly Clark, Hearst Publications, and the Los Angeles Times and Mirror Corporation, among others, return all of our land to us immediately. No amount of money can buy the Mother Earth. Therefore, the California land claims case has no meaning. The Earth is our mother, and we cannot sell her. According to the land prices now that is being sold, I think uh, we should get uh, something far much more than 47 cents an acre. How do you feel about that, Dorothy? I don't feel 47 cents an acre is fair. 50, 57 cents or uh, 50, uh, 45 or uh, whatever it is. If I was going to buy a piece of uh, property from you, would you tell it to me for 47 cents an acre? Huh? Huh? Well, how the hell are you going to be able to buy me? Huh? Tell me. It's like worrying about whether you got the right amount from the estate of your great-great-aunt, you know, that uh, your life's got to be richer and fuller than, than worrying about that. I don't need it. Why not? Why else? I mean, that's... that's oh, not I'm not a rich man. You know, like, I've been hearing about this thing. Ever since I was little, and so is that guy. I, I don't mean that this guy will probably hear the same bullshit. Uh, yeah. What they're going to give us, four or five hundred dollars, you can earn that in one month, you know, that ain't nothing. No, of course it's not a, a just settlement, uh, and nobody ever, uh, I, at least that I know of, uh, has ever pretended that it was a just settlement. Any day now, Pearl Hersey will receive a check for six hundred dollars. The U.S. government mailed out seventy thousand such checks to California Indians a few days ago. The money is compensation for land taken from the Indians' ancestors in 1853. Pearl and the other members of the Pitt River Tribe intend to refuse the checks. They say they never agreed to accept 47 cents an acre for their land. They charge that government officials and their own lawyers deceived them when the settlement was negotiated nine years ago. They say the amount is too little to repay them for outrages of the past or to provide any solution to present problems. The Pitt River protest reflects the feelings of many California Indians. After all, they, they got a lot of, they made a lot of money. 
you know, off in this Indian land. And that 40 cents an acre that they, they wanted to give us is not enough. Trappers first entered the area in 1832, this land in northeastern California was inhabited by 3,000 Indians. In 1848, when Buckskin Jack and Old Wool were children, Mexico ceded California to the United States through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The United States government agreed in that treaty not to force California Indians from their homes. In 1851, Congress passed the Private Land Claims Act. It required all persons in California to register claims to land they occupied. Land not claimed within two years was open to homesteading. The Indians did not speak English, and they did not know about the white man's laws. They lost their land without even knowing they had lost it. The U.S. Cavalry rounded up many Pit River Indians and marched them some 200 miles to a reservation. The Indians were later to describe the ordeal to their grandchildren. The soldiers were on horses, driving them just like cattle, and how they would whip them and, uh, and kick them, and uh, some of the women were pregnant, and the soldiers would, uh, would rape them. I don't know just what year it was, but anyway, the, uh, those white people were treating them mean. He said, uh, he fed the Indians on a long table, and then when uh, he called them all together, as many as they could bribe them with the food, then they sh start shooting them, kill all them Indians that came there to eat. By 1880, 85% of the Indian people were dead. A handful of them had managed to evade the roundup and remain on the old lands. A few more had slipped away from the reservation and made their way home. When a white man kill my people all, and my answers, my kids, little girls and boys, slam them in a tree and I kill them, you know. I kill one pale face, son of a bitch. I do time for it. I've done 12 years and five months in Folsom Penitentiary. The ancestral homeland of the Pit River Indians extended over three and one half million acres from Goose Lake on the Oregon border, west to Mount Shasta, and south to Mount Lassen. Today, the 580 Indians on the Pitt River tribal roll are virtually landless. Whites own and occupy the more valuable sections of the land. Seven large power plants on the Pitt River send electricity to all parts of Northern California. Most Indian homes still have no electricity or indoor plumbing. The Indians still feel the land belongs to them, and many resent the way the land is now used. I think what these people are doing here is right because we still own this land. Like that sign back there doesn't mean nothing to me because they don't own this, you know. They're not the legal owners of this. It's us. And we can come in here, and I think what we should do is come in here and stop these people from doing this act. They're just destroying everything by cutting these trees. When they take them to the mill, they make all that smoke and stuff that just destroys everything. Ten large corporations have holdings in the area. Few of them hire Indians. 95% of the Indians are unemployed during the winter months. Then they say, well, they won't work if they did have a job, but they don't really give, give us a chance. I mean, sure, maybe there's a few of us won't work, but, but there's, there's a lot of others that want to work, that, that, that would like to have a job and, and earn a decent living, you might say, you know, in the white man's world. Nearly two-thirds of this land today belongs to the federal government. It is national forest and park land, popular with campers, hunters, and fishermen.
Many Indians live on land allotted to them by the government. It is hard to improve living conditions on this land. It is rocky and barren and unproductive. Tell you what the white man did to my people. They pushed them over to a goddamn place where there ain't no water. Right? And the Indian ain't got no money like the white man. We'll get no machinery. And the white man put us out here where there's nothing out there. You can see if you own so. That's where the white man did it for you. Know? And then they told him, well, look at the kind of house we live in. We get no water, no toilet or something. Some Indians live on rancherias, small reservations that are owned by the government. They don't belong to the Indians. Tribal councilman Raymond Legoo moved on to vacated rancheria land after his logging business went bankrupt 10 years ago. Like most Pit River Indians, he does not trust the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Legou did not go through the required bureau procedure for moving on to land. A bureau official has told him to get off the land. Legou is still there. I told the Bureau of Indian Affairs, if there's anybody trespassing here, it's you, because this is Indian land, I'm Indian. And you show me any kind of law that says that I'm trespassing, and I could probably find you lots of laws that says you're trespassing. And uh, so we had a kind of a... a Understanding there, I told him to never come through their gate to, uh, and on this place unless I asked him to come from now on that I didn't want anything to do with the kind of lying propaganda that he was been feeding me all this time. I think uh, I, my feeling on this, on the Pit River, is that, um, uh, that we do have kind of a relationship with them, but um, Pit Rivers do have a strong feeling against the Bureau of Indian Affairs as, as, a, as a bureau. Uh, they don't want the Bureau to go up into their area. 21 to Raymond Legu, 20. The Bureau of Indian Affairs does not recognize the Pit River Tribal Council because the tribe will not conform to the Bureau standards for organization. Without Bureau recognition, though, the Tribal Council does not have access to $20,000 in tribal funds nor does it have access to the only land allotted to the tribe that has any value, the 9,000-acre XL Ranch near Alturas. The XL Ranch was purchased by the government in 1938 for 31 Pit River families. Land for the remaining Pit River Indians was to be acquired later, but no purchases were ever made. The Forest family controls most of the XL's resources. Aaron Forrest, the Indian ranch manager, is currently attempting, with Bureau of Indian Affairs backing, to clear title to the ranch for himself and ten families now assigned to it. Five of those assignments belong to Forrest's immediate family, although only Aaron Forrest lives on the ranch. Four of the families of the XL claim Aaron Forrest works only for his own interests and that he has tried to run them off. He's not all his land to run away. I mean, not Indians. And when he does that, well, the land's, uh, the money's gone associated, then I don't get no, I have no place to pass him a cow. Well, he tried to hurt us doing, you know, in the way he's like uh, trying to throw this guy in for stealing horse. He said, he knows better than that. I think that it's a matter of personal ambition. You know, some people are ambitious and some people are satisfied with being what they are. I, 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 uh, I felt it was a challenge to try to be as good as somebody else and find out that you can be if you, if you preserve, have, have the perseverance. Long before the XL Ranch was purchased, the Pit River tribal leaders had petitioned the government for the return of a portion of their land. In 1927 and 1931, delegations traveled to Washington with a hand-drawn map of their claim. Their pleas fell on deaf ears. In 1946, the Indian Claims Commission was created. Again, the Tribal Council submitted the Pit River claim. In 1959, the Claims Commission conceded that three and a half million acres had been illegally taken from them. The next step was for the Court of Claims to decide a satisfactory settlement. 
1963, Ramsey Clark was assistant attorney general. He met with the Pitt River attorney and attorneys for other California Indian tribes with pending claims. Clark told the attorneys the government wanted to settle all the claims out of court. He offered a lump sum of $29.1 million. This was allegedly the value of the land at the time it was taken. The date of valuation was 1853. So in a real sense, you see, it was fictive. That is, it wasn't real because there was, in the classical sense, there was no buyer or seller or market for 63 million acres of land. And the fact is that there were, you know, there were millions of acres of land um, at that time uh, well, which no one would have bought. Who would have bought Death Valley? Who would have bought uh, Mount Whitney? The $29 million offer amounts to 47 cents an acre. In 1820, federal law had established the minimum sale price of homesteading land at a dollar and a quarter an acre. Today, an acre of variegated farmland in the Pitt River area sells for $650 to $1,000. The Indian groups voted to accept or reject the settlement. The Pitt River Indians rejected the settlement at a meeting at Modoc High School in Alturas. Gladys O'Neill remembers the reaction of the Pitt River attorney, Louis Phelps. He more or less just kind of reached down on the side of his uh, chair or desk, I can't recall just exactly what it was, and he picked up his briefcase and he just walked out. And I thought, well, that's a funny way to, for our attorney to, to act, because it seemed as though that uh, instead of being friendly, well, then he just left the room in such a hostile manner. Lewis Phelps had already spent eight years on the case, and unless the Indians approved the settlement, the case might have dragged on several more years. Phelps wrote to the Indian Claims Commission and requested a mail ballot for Pitt River Indians who had not voted. He said the Alturas vote was too low to be representative. Because we were already told that there would be no absentee ballot involved in this deciding factor about this $29 million. So we just took it for granted that it wouldn't be. And then when the pitcher voted no on it, well, then we thought we had it made. And then shortly afterwards is when we were notified that absentee ballots were being sent out to all other pitcher Indians. When the mail ballots were added to the votes cast at Alturas, there was a 24-vote margin in favor of accepting the settlement. Arthur Watkins, former U.S. Senator from Utah, was the commissioner who authorized the mail ballot. Watkins feels use of the mail ballot was justified. Send out absentee ballot, that meant, that meant they wanted more votes, more Indians to vote on it. The Indians say the ballots were sent to persons who had no interest in the settlement. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was the one who sent out, they used their Pit River rule in order to send out the absentee, and a lot of these uh, uh, absentee were sent to Pit Rivers who were also out from the state. Even Aaron Forrest says the mail ballot did not represent the feelings of the tribe. I, I think the tragedy of the mail ballot vote uh, it has, was that a lot of Indians that really didn't know how to read and write got a mail ballot. And so the, the, uh, the Indians, and I say this, uh, 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 not condemning them for what they are, but um, many of our Pit River Indians by this time, we're you know, one sixteenth Indian, and something else white, and one one sixty fourth, and they're really not Indian at all, except they qualified under the under the Claims Act as Indians, and they readily they could care less about uh, getting a square deal from the government. They just wanted the money as quickly as possible, and they're the ones who really carried the vote because the old Indians didn't even know what those ballots were for. The tribal council told Phelps to have the mail ballot declared invalid. Phelps conferred with Commissioner Watkins and Watkins set aside one day to hear Pit River objections at Eureka, 200 miles out of Pit River territory. The tribal council then sent Phelps a letter telling him he was fired. He didn't encourage us as, a, as an attorney to, as our, as a, to our client. He more or less kind of discouraged us. There was no encouragement whatsoever. Well, that's when we uh, decided we should look around for somebody else to help us. Mm -hmm. And then we finally got in touch with Mr. Belli. That the other lawyers... Attorney Melvin Belli appeared with the Indians at Eureka. Watkins refused to recognize him, saying the Indians already had an attorney approved by the BIA, Louis Phelps. Uh, this lawyer is going to represent the Indians. The Indians said, we don't want him. We want Belli. They said, you can't have Belli. You'll take the one that we approve. 
So the lawyer that uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had selected for the Indians sat with the United States Attorney opposing all of the desires of the Indians. 125 Indians attended the Eureka meeting. Eight were allowed to speak. All denounced the voting procedure, the settlement, or the conduct of Mr. Phelps. A BIA official testified that there was nothing irregular about the voting procedures. A judge, who had been Phelps' associate in the case, testified that most of the Indians wanted to accept the settlement. The commissioners ruled that the objectors did not represent the majority of the Indians. They said the vote would stand. Why, it's as though these people were, were uh, inmates of an asylum or were underage. They're, 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 they're treated as though they haven't uh, the capacity to appreciate what they want. Commissioner Watkins, now 86, does not remember Phelps or Belli or why he refused to recognize the tribal chairman as spokesman for the tribe. I don't even remember that, uh, that he spoke. The Indians had 90 days to appeal the decision. They no longer considered Phelps their lawyer, and the BIA refused to recognize Belli. Without a lawyer, there was no way to appeal. Today, it would take an act of Congress for California Indians to receive a larger settlement. Senator John Tunney says the Indians will have to show that they were defrauded of their rights. Well, I think that what the Indians are going to have to uh, show is that uh, the advice that they got from their attorneys was bad because, uh, as I recall, uh, they accepted uh, the settlement on the advice of the attorneys that it was all that they were going to get. Now, if they could show uh, that the attorneys had given them extremely bad advice uh, to the point, in a sense, that they were uh, defrauded uh, of their rights, uh, then I think uh, that there's a chance to give them uh, an additional compensation. There was no question about the bona fides of my being wanted, but there was a question as to the bona fides of the lawyer that they got, and who got, incidentally, for appearing for them and opposing their desires, $300,000 of their money. Lewis Phelps is a partner in the San Francisco law firm of Dunn, Phelps & Mills. He has refused all requests for an interview about his role in the settlement. Leonard Hill, area director of the BIA at that time, also refused to be filmed. He said the tribal council had no authority to hire and fire attorneys for the tribe. But Lewis Phelps had been hired by the tribal council. Well, I think it's hard to do justice to uh, Indians who died seven generations ago or six generations ago or five generations ago. I see, I really don't think that that, um, uh, I don't think you can compensate for wrongs that happened uh, <clears throat> hundreds of years ago. I mean, suppose your people came from Ireland and they were run out during the potato famine. Uh, can Ireland do justice uh, to them by giving you some potatoes or giving you some money or something? It doesn't really work that way. But they had the leaders clamored to get a law of this kind, and they got the law, and we went ahead to do the very best we could. They didn't, uh, Congress didn't lay down the rules, but we had to follow either. We had to use it as good the horse sense. I came in in 1961. I felt that our burden was to settle those cases as generously and as quickly as we could because uh, generations of Indians had worried and about old wrongs, and they kept looking back, and they needed to look forward in their lives. So I set about trying to settle the cases as quickly and as generously as we could. And we had to get it done. They spent all this time and money. Now what were we going to do? We had not let them tie the thing up for another two or three years or another ten years arguing back and forth over the appeals and whatnot as to who's right among the two Indian groups. Well, we just decided, we knew those things would happen, did that had happened in other cases, we just simply said, arbitrarily, all right, if you don't like this, you know what you can do about it. And we settled more in the, <clears throat> the three years that I was there than had been settled in the previous uh, 15 years of the act combined, in fact, many times more. And the Indians of California settlement was uh, the largest. And uh, I think by the standards of the law, which I don't think are real, I, I don't think they're meaningful, I don't think they apply to the human lives of the people, uh, I think it was a generous settlement. I couldn't even buy bread at that 47 cents an acre. That's what I see right now. Well, if we accepted the $400, and this is all we gained from it after our, our leaders and our ancestors have been fighting the federal government for 100 years or more trying to get a decent settlement uh, if we were to turn around and sell out for this amount of money 
then I think it's wrong. The Pitt River Indians have no money and no political power. Most are adamant that they will not accept the government checks. Tribal leaders tried to organize Indians throughout the state to follow their example. The only thing that we're trying to do for you people, we've asked, this, asked to have this meeting called for the Indian people, for the people that still want to fight, that don't want to accept 47 cents an acre for the state of California. Please. California Indians who oppose the settlement recently announced that they have filed a $5 billion suit against the government. We want to make the public aware of what's happened to California Indians. And maybe if there is enough political pressure and enough public pressure put on Congress, we can receive a more fair settlement. The lawsuit was filed on behalf of all California Indians by George Foreman of the California Rural Indian Land Project. Foreman says the government defrauded the Indians. The Secretary of the Interior failed to adequately supervise the fulfillment of the attorney contracts which he had approved. The commission itself failed to investigate the claims and inform the Indian people of the claims. The commission itself knew that the settlement was not a just one. It knew that the settlement had not been fairly approved, yet it approved the settlement. Contrary to the assertion of the Department of Justice at the time, 1964, the Indian Claims Commission could have and should have awarded damages to the Indians of California, not only for the land, which was worth at the time much more than 47 cents an acre, but also for things like the gold in the land, timber, and most important to the Indians of California, the genocide that was committed against perhaps 100,000 or more Indian people who resided in California between 1853 and, and the 1880s. The Pitt River Indians say money is secondary. They want their land back. No, it's not the money, it's just that they should give us land. You know, more land to live on, to be productive on, or just to raise, you know, raise your own garden, raise your kids, and a place to be buried, if anything, a place to call home. Mm -hmm.